Hello there. Welcome to Birding with Lois. This is a show where we try to encourage you to go birding. If you're new, welcome. If you're experienced, I'm glad you're here. And if you're really experienced or you have a story to tell, hey, you can always write to us and see maybe about being on the panel or something. The show is Birding with Lois, which means our website is birdingwithlois.global, and our YouTube is Birding with Lois, and the email is birdingwithlois at gmail.com. Yeah, I know, we use that phrase a lot, but at least you don't forget it. So this show is one where I have a guest, and I want to introduce you to Curtis Dykstra. Hello, thank you for having me. It's, I'm glad you got here. So tell the, tell the listeners how you got here, how, how we ended up getting connected. Well, uh, somebody connected with me after a, a conference I went to and, on LinkedIn, and uh, uh, Jason Robert Shaw, uh, um, and he, he had a connection with you, I guess, through After Hours and, and such, and, and uh, said that I should make a connection with you. So then we kind of reached out to each other and um, started chatting about the possibility of, of uh, doing an interview. And, and uh, so, yeah kind of how that came about. And we actually, um, I had seen the the um, Coffee with the Birds. I had seen uh-huh. that. I hadn't realized who you were. Yes. I didn't know how to reach you, but I had seen that. Because what I did is I, I went looking for everything I could find that people were doing mm-hmm. having to do with birds. And right. either to find out whether or not we didn't need the show mm-hmm. or to find out people who could come and be in the panel. I think it was in the course of our first conversation where you said, oh, wait, you're the one who does the coffee with the birds. Uh, yep. And so we made that connection. And, yeah. and I'll be talking a bit about that uh, program today, which is uh, mm-hmm. a lot of fun. So Yeah. And uh, we also are going to hopefully be doing a radio interview because I have a radio show and a, a video show. And he does videos, and I'm hoping to tie into one of his projects in there. So we're going we're gonna to be doing a lot of stuff together. But today, today we are talking about his program, his presentation about building community. And I know you're talking about building a birding community, but this applies to everybody, whatever the focus is. So do you want to, do you want to get started with that? Why don't you introduce us to what it is you're going to do? Sure, sure, we can do that. Um, The program that I put together was initially... Uh, for a group of interpreters. So not not interpreting language, but interpreting nature. So when you think of the National Park Service and going to a national park, the park rangers do interpretive programming. And so I was at a conference um, and gave a presentation at, at the conference to other fellow interpreters, other fellow nature interpreters on growing your flock, uh, how birds and people create community. And I figured that would maybe be a good way to connect with you and your audience as well in not so much just sticking to how you can do how you can build a birding community or some of the things that maybe take ways to building a birding community but obviously like you said uh, it, it applies to a lot of different types of communities and i'll get into that as we go but community is a really important aspect to the work that i do and to the work that a lot of us do not just in my field but in all fields of of uh, uh, of works and uh, work and careers, um, and I see a major part of my role as a park interpreter, as a naturalist, uh, to be facilitators of community growth. And if anybody out there is interested in facilitating community growth from the ground up, I hope that this can be of help to you. Um, whether you impact one person. Uh, one time or a group of, of many people, um, a group of uh, many people or a small group of people many times, um, the question becomes, are we provoking them? And I mean the good sense of provoking, um, prodding them with our passions. Are we, are we uh, engaging them with our passions to the level of them then wanting to take that passion and give it to others? 
and that's where community grows and that's where we're going to head with this uh with this presentation and uh hopefully then we'll have some time at the end where we can talk and you can ask some questions um but i'll get started with with my story uh who a little bit of who i am um and i grew up in west michigan i was born and raised in grand rapids and i live uh west of grand rapids now in ottawa county um if you do this you know it's kind of right here in west michigan i've got a, a picture coming up here in just a moment of where where i i live but my story is this i grew up in west michigan and there's a culture of outdoorism here whether hunting or fishing or hiking or camping um, on the weekend what do you do you go up north that's that's just the saying we use around here you go up north that means you're going to go do something outdoors and I was a part of that. My parents took me camping, hiking all over the state, all over the country, really. I've, I've been to 48 out of 50 states. I still need North Dakota and Hawaii. Um, but I was given a, a huge gift of travel and engagement in the national parks and things like that. Also at home, I was engaged with my parents with uh, bird feeders. And you can see the picture of me there um, at a nature center uh, near Grand Rapids when I was a child. Uh, feeding chickadees. And I never forgot that moment. And I was thrilled when the picture surfaced again, um, that I could see some of my first moments of being impacted with passion that I now carry into adulthood and beyond. So um, that's a bit of my, my story of childhood. Well, I, I went to school in Iowa, and I spent a semester abroad in Belize, Central America, and I already had an interest. I was an environmental studies major, and I had an, uh, a, a, an interest in the outdoors and didn't quite know what I wanted to do with it, something with education. Well, I went down to the tropics, and I saw birds, and I was floored. I was, wow, there's so many birds and just so much beauty, and, and I really engaged with that. And then I took an ornithology class when I got back to the States, and the rest is history. I, I graduated um, with an interest in, in birds, and I got a job in North Carolina as a state park ranger. And I learned underneath another ranger who knew all his bird songs um, how to listen to birds and, and how to engage people with birds and really loved that. So that's kind of where some of my passions grew from home at an early age to, to um, a career as a park ranger a ranger in North Carolina. Well, eventually I moved back here to West Michigan and now I work for Ottawa County Parks. Um, and Ottawa County Parks is, like I said, just west of Grand Rapids. You can see by the picture up on the screen now. Um, and so we've got a big population center nearby in Grand Rapids and um, we are on the shores of Lake Michigan. And so, I love West Michigan. I love the seasons of West Michigan, the, uh, all four seasons. We get them all here. Unfortunately, I know you in California don't necessarily get that. Um, <laughs> and I love winter. A lot of people don't like it. Um, I love winter when, when and I, I just want it to be lots of snow instead of just the in-between. But either way, I digress. Um, Ottawa County Parks is a special place because it's one of the park systems that I grew to love. Um, even before I worked for it. Um, and right now we have 40 different properties. And for a county system here in Michigan, that's pretty phenomenal. 40 properties and over 7,000 acres to explore. And we're not just soccer fields and baseball fields and playgrounds. Um, we are actually more of a nature-based uh, nature recreation uh, park system. So we encourage nature study, hiking, mountain biking, and road biking. We've got uh, trails. We've got, we encourage kayaking and cross-country skiing and all of that kind of outdoor activity. Um, we, we focus a lot of our properties on greenways, which you can see on the map along the Grand River, which is the, the longest river in Michigan and the second largest watershed in Michigan. Um, and preserving land along those greenways, both for their beauty, but also for their natural diversity. Uh, we have a nature center that we do programming out of. That's where I'm speaking you, to you from. That's where my office is. We do public programming um, uh, of all sorts, uh, focusing on all sorts of different recreation, but also nature, nature uh, wildflowers, to insects, to fish, to birds, and you name it. Um, and then we also do private programming. Schools, uh, we have lots of school groups of, of all the way from pre-K to 
um, to high school and beyond. And then we do uh, senior groups and things like that. So wide variety of opportunities here. And so that's just a little bit about me and who I am and how I got to where I am here. Um, and, and now the story kind of um, my story specifically with the birding community. And before you switch the slide, I do want to note that that top picture is Lake Michigan from one of our parks. And you mentioned, Lois, the, how big Lake Michigan is and how beautiful it is. It does look like the ocean. Um, and that is Rosie Mound Park there, high up on the, the Dune Bluff. And that's one of the special things about Ottawa County um, is that we are on Lake Michigan. And we have a very unique feature in the freshwater dune ecosystem. And that's one of my passions too, is teaching people about that ecosystem. But that is Lake Michigan in the background. And the, the lower picture there is the Grand River at one of our other popular parks, Grand Ravines Park. So I wanna get into some lessons learned about community building. Um, lessons learned in particular about the things that are listed on your screen. Um, I'm going to be speaking about my experiences and in being involved in the growth of the Ottawa County birding community or flock, as you might call it. And the lessons I learned along the way, the lessons in passion, um, the importance of utilizing your passion as the driving force of community building, um, lessons in resources, the necessity of learning to tap your resources, um, and not making yourself do everything. Um, the importance of listening, uh, the, the benefit of listening and adjusting to your community's needs and innovation. And those are related. When you listen and you want to change, then you need to innovate. How essential innovation is to meet changing needs and circumstances. And all of that, then the goal is self-sustainability of community, that it grows on its own. It, it's not just dependent on one person or one program, but that it starts to grow on its own. And, and this wasn't something that I set out to do. It was something to, that just happened. And I look back on that now and, and I see the things that, that formed it along the way. And that's where this presentation comes out of. Um, so my passion, uh, my passion is, is birds. It's more than just birds, but in particular, we're gonna talk about birding. But I ask people, what is your passion? Uh, and that's where this connects to more than just birds. What is the thing that you would do even if you didn't get paid to do it? Um, can you identify that thing? Um, because if you can, if, if you have some part of your work or some part of your life that, that meets that criteria, that's where community can be uh, most easily grown is where you connect it to your passions because they're contagious. When you're passionate about something, that 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 impacts other people. Um, and if there are managers or supervisors out there, you know, people who are in leadership positions, I always encourage them to look for those passions and the people that they that that they that work under them. Because when you can tap those resources where they meet your broader mission as an organization that's where things change and that's where change can occur. That's where positive growth can occur. So don't just, uh, just do something, get out there and start. Don't just um, create, don't, don't spend too much time creating a plan. Just get out there and, and do something. And, and start where you um, are comfortable. Um, the, the passion that I have uh, for birds largely was, was um, uh, it just turned out to be bird walks and a few bird programs, things like that, connecting to the people who are already interested and gathering that, that group of people around that common, that common passion, that common uh, interest. Um, but, but more than that, uh, that we didn't want the, the I didn't want the community to just stagnate and be there and just the small tight knit group of just a few people that were already interested in that thing. My desire is, of course, to impact everybody who wants to. So then I, I started to do programs with broad appeal, um, which can be a gateway to more. So by broad appeal, I mean, where can you identify uh, 
where the market and your passions meet. So for me, not everybody's going to identify as a birder, but they might like owls or they might like bald eagles. Those are really good connecting points to people who wouldn't otherwise identify as a birder. And when you can provide programming or ways to engage those topics um, for a broader audience, um, then that gives them more opportunity to engage with a growing community. And so I've done snowy owl programs because we have snowy owls that typically winter just a few miles from the nature center. So it's kind of fun to get out there and show something to people that they didn't realize was right there at their doorstep um, and ignite the passions in them. Uh, too. And then they maybe will re-engage uh, uh, what we're doing in other ways. So it's a gateway to more. Maybe they'll go on a bird walk. Maybe they'll come to coffee with the birds or other programs. Same with bald eagles. We do bald eagle walks where there's a nest at one of our parks along the Grand River and, and get to see the chicks in the nest and things like that. And that's another one of those gateway opportunities for people. One of the other gateways was the Coffee with the Birds program. And this is uh, something that I came up with that it's a broad appeal formula. Several things about it. It's, uh, time, it's an informal time of coffee, donuts, birds, and fellowship. So the connecting points then are who, who loves coffee, right? A lot of people. Who likes donuts? A lot of people. Who likes birds? Even if it's just birds at your bird feeders. There are 45 million birders in the United States. There's a huge resource to tap. Um, and, and so I thought, let's just start with this. Let's watch the feeders at the nature center, eat coffee and donuts, and just talk birds. Ask your questions. I won't have an agenda just other than to talk birds, local bird sightings, identifying the birds at the feeder, and we can just have fun together. And so it was an opportunity for all. You didn't have to be intimidated to participate that you weren't a good birder. You know, maybe you just like the cardinals at your feeder or you don't know how to identify the first bird, but you just have an interest in wanting to know how. That person could engage with somebody who's been birding for 40 years. And so that really started to engage people with what we were doing and engage people with each other. It's not just about engaging me or just the Nature Center, but it's about engaging the people who are already there, a part of the community. And so that naturally led to fellowship. Um, and I, excuse me, um, the, the structure and format of the program changed. Um, and so it is a story of growth and change. Um, and, and that's a little bit of what we're gonna talk about as we continue on. Um, the first time I did this program, there were eight people, okay? eight people that showed up the first two times, I think it was eight people. Um, and eventually we, we topped out at well over a hundred. I think I've got 108 in here. I think we even broke that. I, I forgot to update that. I think we're up to 120 people have participated in an event. So um, how did we get there? Uh, well, the, the growth that we went through between 2013 and 2015, um, it, 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 um, forced us to, well, actually, I'm going to, I'm going to back up a second. The, the next slide there. Um, yep. What was one of the reasons why we grew? <laughs> why did we start to pack the house? Well, one of the things is we tapped our resources. Um, we, as an organization, uh, hired a communication specialist, someone who knows Instagram, Facebook, websites, newsletters, uh, all of that kind of stuff that I'm not necessarily a, 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 an expert in. And when we got that person on board, I could definitely tell that our word was getting out. So how important is it to tap your resources and not just depend on yourself and word of mouth? Because things can travel word of mouth and they should. But, but when you can get it to the masses uh, in, in ways that I'm not familiar with, like Facebook and Instagram and all of those, why not? So we had a... Um, we, we have a website, we have a newsletter, we have Facebook, Instagram, and it was all an attempt to destroy, what I say is destroy the disconnect. Um, the disconnect being what's between us and our mission and, and those who would have chosen to engage had they known about what we were doing, but they didn't know. 
So we want that disconnect to be gone. We want to get our word out to all of those who would want to participate. And this allowed us to do that. And it wasn't just about the numbers. It was about the goal of a self-sustaining community. But this was a huge step in the right direction for us in connecting those people to what we were doing. So then back to Coffee with the Birds specifically, um, it really started to grow exponentially. Uh, 2015 and beyond, um, we outgrew the room we were in. And you can see from the photos here um, just how big we got. Uh, we were filling up that room when we had eight to begin with. And we got to the point where we had to innovate a bit. We had to, I had to listen to what the needs of the community were. And they were really um, wanting to grow in this area. And there were lots of people that were wanting to grow in this area. So what did we do? We did, we split it up. We did two sessions of feeder watching. And in order to not separate those two groups out and, and uh, keep them apart, we did in between that, we did um, a birding tidbit in between. And you can see that on the lower picture there, where the group that, that did the feeder watching then came into the great room, we call it, and I gave a presentation. But then the group that was going to do the second session came into the great room as well. And they intermingled with each other for a time before one group left and the other group then came in to watch birds. So we still had that full community. And I would do all, all of a range of topics from bird identification, to birding stories, personal stories that I uh, had of, of uh, traveling and seeing birds and things like that and connecting people to the resources. Um, we did bird club expos where, where the local birding uh, clubs would, would come and present a bit about themselves. Um, we also grew, you know, who doesn't like, if you like birds, you like photos of birds, right? So we came up with the idea of a photo contest and putting the, the photo of the winner of the photo contest on a mug and selling those mugs as memberships with other perks um, so people could become a part of what we were doing. Um, and take ownership in it. And that exploded. Um, so that's been a lot of fun. We've done that for like five or six years now. You can see I've got, to, got my mug right here uh, for this year um, with a redheaded woodpecker on it. And um, uh, lots of fun to do. Um, we've also then got a mug club now. When you buy the mug, you're part of the mug club. And, and uh, that then we get, get special perks like a picnic with the birds. And I'm going to be doing that next week with our mug club members, a picnic with the birds at one of our parks. So we tried to continue to grow and expand what we were offering um, as the need changed and listen to our audience to engage them. Um, also, some new programs we did were, were birding basics. You know, if you don't know anything about birding, but now you're interested because you went on a, a bald eagle walk, here's what, what you know, we need to know. Um, and so we did beginner bird walks as well and uh, beginner birding programs, how to use binoculars, how to look at bird books, things like that. Well, then this whole thing is growing and growing and growing and bam, COVID-19 and the pandemic. And so now what? Now what do we do? Uh, and this is where innovation comes in. We were innovating already to a growing audience, but now that audience is still there, but I can't be with them. So how can we be with them? Well, I picked up a video camera for the first time ever and started to video myself doing naturalist things out in the woods. I did a video, my first video was a virtual woodcock walk. And we went and we saw a woodcock habitat and I took them on a woodcock walk at night to see them do their display. Um, and that turned into more things like virtual bird walks. I have a friend uh, who does professional video work. And so he and I talked and he and I got together and went to several parks and he videoed me while I was birding. And, and so we stitched together some videos on uh, and put them on YouTube. And then I had a newswire email system so that I could connect with people if they were uh, signed up and I could um, uh, send those videos out to them. I could keep connected with them with other resources, other things, trying to keep them engaged. Even though we couldn't be in person with each other, I wanted to be engaged with them. So birding update newswire is something that continues to this day. Now, I started to burn myself out and I was uh, sending a couple of, a week during the midst of the pandemic when we were all tight in our homes. 
Um, and now I just do it once a month. <laughs> I was going a little overboard, but uh, I was engaging in a new passion for myself for engaging people through this medium and also through video. And I still do my own videos to this very day. And I enjoy that. So we did What's That Bird? I Hear videos teaching people how to listen to birds. We did sitting in songs, birding programs, and we could start to do in-person programs again, where we just sat and we listened instead of walking on a trail close to each other. We could sit and just listen to the birds spread out apart. Um, and so we innovated um, to try to stay engaged. And the community was was uh, happy for it. And um, while we did get low numbers with the in-person programs to start, that was a largely a factor of, of just people's tendency to hold back after the pandemic. Um, going through my notes here, I want to make sure that I hit everything here. Um, so how did how did the COVID-19 impact coffee with the birds? That's the next slide. Um, we had to innovate big time because we couldn't gather together as a community. That was one of our biggest community events that we did. And I said, well, how can we do this? And so I talked to my friend again, who did professional video work, and he's also a birder. He likes birds. So that's a good combination. And and he's the one that had done these virtual bird walks. And I said, well, how about, could you set up cameras in our uh, wildlife den, looking out at the bird feeders and with me on a camera, and we just broadcast this to people? And he said, yes. And so we did that. And it was amazing because the audience that we reached was an audience that was largely one that hadn't been in person before. They were engaging with something new. And so we were reaching a broader audience by engaging online. And, and so um, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of hard work to put together, but, um, and it evolved as we went. But it was uh, um, hugely rewarding. And what ended up happening is at the end of the pandemic, or it's still, I, I know that COVID is still out there, but we're all kind of adjusting to, to a new way of life now. And, and that is still a part of our DNA. We still do video of our coffee with the birds. And I have a little uh, highlights video from the 2020, 2021 season that I hope kind of gives you a little bit of a flavor for what this program is all about. And if you don't mind playing that right now, um, that would be great. First of all, what is coffee with the birds? Coffee with the birds is an informal time to enjoy coffee, pastries, birds, and community. Kestrel imagery is uh, Rick Feldman, and he has been so gracious during COVID to Ottawa County Parks. And now he is helping us live stream to you, Coffee with the Birds. And we could not do this without him. So just a huge thanks. Raise your mugs to Kestrel Imagery for allowing us to do this today. We watch the birds at the feeder. We identify the birds, um, talk about them, their uh, identification features, um, habits, things like that of the birds that we're seeing at the feeder. But we also always have it open to informal discussion. Another sighting too, Chris uh, Sprick from Holland says, for the last week or so, I have been having several robins attend my heated bird bath. It seems too early for them to be here. Do they forget to head south? Um, they become much less common in the winter, but they are here. Oh, there's the robin. The robin is back in the bird bath. Oh, what a treat. Proof positive we have robins in the winter. This is, is there anybody else out there who's been seeing robins? Uh, Carol from Hudsonville last Sunday, she's, there were at least 20 robins around my bird bath. 20 robins, we had two. That's 10 times as many as we had. You're not supposed to do that, Carol. Now, come on, <laughs> you're showing us up. <laughs> Even if we're apart, this is a part of coffee with the birds. Drinking coffee and eating donuts. The red does not go all the way over to the beak, so you can tell that that's the female red belly. Oh, got a nice chunk there too. 
I can only imagine what that would feel like in my stomach as I eat my donut, right? <laughs> Through your sponsorship, uh, with buying a Mug Club membership, you help to feed the birds here at the feeder and you help to sponsor this program, so thank you. There's the red pole on number four. We got it on the screen, uh, except for my, I'm in the way. <laughs> there we go, take me out of there. <laughs> There's the common red pole. Oh, there he goes. Oh, <laughs> look at that. Look at this shot of the Downey and Harry Woodpecker. Somebody's gonna have to take a screenshot of that. <laughs> that is that is too good right there. As your Junko in the, in the picture there, you can see the brown back and the gray head very distinct ring around the neck there. Oh, that, that's actually a really nice looking bird, bird too. Um, but we see them on occasion, not real often, so it's kind of a, a, a notable uh, visitor to the feeder. There is also another red-bellied woodpecker that came in. There, there he is, a male red-bellied woodpecker, often called a red-headed woodpecker, but even though they have red on the head, it's not a fully red head. You see a lot of gray on the face, and. It is coming in. This is a first for coffee with the birds ever. The pileated woodpecker is an impressive species, the largest species in North America, if you don't count the ivory-billed woodpecker. Look at that treat. That's the male. You can see the red comes all the way down the forehead to the bill, and it's got red on the cheek. The male is called the mailer stripe. There it is. That's the female. You can see the black mailer stripe and the black gray forehead. What a treat! Whew. High fives. Virtual high five. Um, deleted woodpecker, folks. I hope you enjoyed the video, um, giving you a little flavor of, of this this program that has evolved so much over the years and is one that continues to this day. And um, one of the things you saw in there was the mug shots. We had fun since we couldn't be together. We had everybody take shots of where you were watching Coffee with the Birds at home, where were where, where, where your bird feeders. And, and uh, that way, maintaining some sort of connection in a time when we were I'm struggling to make connections with people. So moving on from this, you know, we've, th this community had really started to grow and become an organism, a living organism on its, on its own. And so how then could we make this self-sustaining? Um, and just to kind of wrap up this presentation, there's a few things that I draw from my experience that help to make it self-sustaining. And that is, one of the things is repeat, repeat, repeat. Yes, I'm going to repeat that. Repeat, repeat, repeat. Um, because it's really important. The Downy and the Hairy Woodpecker is one of the prime examples that I give. You saw in the video the Downy and the Hairy Woodpecker, and you saw how different they are. Um, and it, I've described that difference between a Downy and a Hairy Woodpecker a thousand times. And I probably do it most every episode that we do of Coffee with the Birds. Um, I could easily tire of this, but it's that 1,001st person that needs to hear it, um, just the same as the first. And so remembering that repeating is a good way to learn, and also then you're not forgetting the person that is just engaging for the first time. Um, and we, I learn and retain things through repetition, bird songs in particular. Um, I learn through repeating it to myself 
And so I repeat it when I'm on my bird walks. Um, I'll say it five, 10 times. If I hear it really well and I try to ingrain it in somebody's mind that that's a good bird song to learn. So repeat, repeat, repeat um, is definitely uh, a way to help your audience learn your passion, learn the details of your passion. And, and when they learn the details of your passion, then they can better engage other people with it. Um, and so um, the next step of, uh, of that is once, once your community has grown and has gained their own abilities and what, what it ever, whatever it is that you're engaging with, um, then you can, after training, you can mentor and you can help uh, encourage them to volunteer. I've got a, a picture of several people up here on the screen um, that have engaged with us in this process. Um, Ty, first of all, right in the middle there, um, that's me and Ty, and we have gone birding together off the clock. You know, I've, I've taken him, he was a teenage, not even a teen, he may have been 12 or 13 years old when his dad brought him in and said, I don't know what to do with him because he loves birds and I don't know how to feed that. Can you help me? And I said, you bet. <laughs> and so he became an, an awesome birder and I, uh, he volunteered his, uh, his skills on uh, bird walks and birding expeditions. Um, and people loved him being around. He was youthful, you know, he's youthful. And, and so people love to see youthful faces involved with this. He was also, he's also a very good ear. Um, so he was, uh, a big help. Um, and so that, that's been a lot of fun to, to help inspire the passion in, in the youth. Um, Eric there on the left is somebody who engaged with us in the last few years and has become a, uh, really passionate about eBird. And he's also a really good bird identifier. And so um, I've uh, taken him on as a volunteer for our bird walks whenever he can to do the eBird checklists and also to engage people as the size of the groups are big. It's hard for me as one person to engage those groups myself. And so I've kind of targeted him as somebody that has the ability to and the passion to engage the audience. So um, when you pick people out like that as volunteers, it helps them to grow in their passions too, and and uh, then share it with others, both in those group settings, but also beyond that to to his own friends and family too. Um, and uh, Lisa, up there in the upper right corner, she was passionate about uh, snowy owls, and so I engaged her with, "Hey, can you go find the snowy owls? I'll do the presentation at the nature center, and then I'll call you, and you'll have the snowy owl in the scope." And then I'll just go and, and, and meet you where you're at. I mean, boom, that's really easy. And so it made, it made that program a whole lot easier. Um, and and uh, was a, a great way for her to be engaged in what we were doing. Also training uh, staff here at the Nature Center. That's kind of specific to my situation here. But, but um, st training the staff who may not be confident bird identifiers, giving them some of the basics, even if they don't know how to identify all the birds, how do you engage somebody with the birds that they're seeing at the feeder. Um, it's more than just naming the bird. It's watching behavior and, and noticing differences and, and uh, keeping engaged with it, not just naming it and moving on to the next thing. So um, teaching them some of those skills so that others can engage others. Um, the next slide is uh, uh, focused on shared personal experiences. So we enable community to grow on its own through sharing personal experiences. Like I said, I took Ty on trips and then I would share those experiences in my uh, birding tidbits or in other presentations that I would do. Um, and then we also would share those experiences together when we did uh, trips, uh, birding outings through the nature center here. And so those shared experiences really helped us to bond in personal relationships and friendships. Friendships come about through these experiences. And if you don't get in this to have friendships, then, then your community is not going to grow. Um, you have to be ready to, to invest yourselves in people beyond just being the presenter or the expert. But um, to to be a real person with them, to have fun with them. As you saw in the video, I like to have fun with my audiences. I like to be one of them um, and, and, and really make people feel comfortable engaging with that community. 
I don't want to be up here and everybody else down here or make them feel that way. I want everybody to be on the same plane and feel accepted, whether they're just getting into birds and don't know, you know, the difference between a chickadee and a, and a robin, you know, like I want them to feel just as comfortable as anybody else. Um, and then it's passing the torch. Um, making sure that the people that, that, that you are impacting them, uh, encouraging them to impact others. Um, saying, hey, who do you know that could benefit from this experience? Who do you know that could benefit from knowing more about birds? And, and I saw people start to engage their own communities with these things and then those communities connecting with us here. And, and just what I now say is that me and my career and, and many other people in different careers can be catalysts for community. And that's what I view myself as, as trying to be a catalyst to get it to, to grow, to get it to, to start and to grow on its own. So that it's not dependent on me or not dependent on one person, but it's dependent on the passion for the common thing, the birds in my case, um, and um, make it about the community and not yourself. I have more to learn. Um, youth, engaging more youth in this. Um, uh, and I've been helped actually by the pandemic, which there was a silver lining to it. There's what I call COVID birders now. And there's a lot of youth, but there's also a lot of adults that have come out of the pandemic interested in birds because they were at home. They were watching. They put up bird feeders. What else do you do? You know, you want to look outside and do something more than just watch TV. And and so I call them COVID birders now. And we've got a whole group of people that coming out of this pandemic that has helped our community to grow. And now how do we engage them in in Re, in the in the actual community that's going on um and also diversity um i i'm really passionate about wanting to make sure that we don't have stereotypes of who a birder is and who a birder isn't and so that anybody can feel open and free to engage with this activity um i have a, a friend felix who was willing to do an interview and so i i did some interview with him called behind the binoculars and um I hope to release some more of that eventually. I've gotten busy since since I've been back in the office uh, after we moved back into the office after the pandemic uh, lockdown. Um, but um, I want I want people to feel free to be a part of this community, whoever they are. Um, so, what are the takeaways? What are the lessons learned? Lessons in passion, right? The importance of utilizing your passion. That is the driving force of community building. If there's one important thing, it's that. Start with your passion, but engage your resources because um, you can't do it all on your own. And other people are experts in other things that can help you to grow community. And listen to your communities as they grow and adjust to their needs or and innovate then along the way, especially when things are out of your control, like a pandemic. Um, and strive towards self-sustaining community community that grows on its own and don't wait until you've got the perfect plan just start where you're at start with what you know to do and grow from there and i hope that these lessons these examples are, are things that you can utilize in your own situations whatever your passions are um, in growing community and can be a good encouragement to you that's the reason for me doing this is to share that passion for community with others. And um, I want to thank you, Lois, for giving me the opportunity to present a bit on that. And um, with that, I'll draw my presentation to a close and uh, would love to engage with you, Lois, on uh, any questions that you might have or others who are watching uh, what questions you may have. Well, that was a wonderful presentation. Thank you very much, Curtis. And I, I really liked your, your, you had all these different little stories. I mean, there's one slide and five stories, man. <laughs> this is very good. <laughs> it's, it's hard sometimes it, to choose where, where to, to yeah, stop. And that's, yeah. I get excited about it when I talk about it because it's, it is exciting for me to, to know mm -hmm. Uh, how the community is growing, all those little stories. And it's so, I so want to share everything that I can, but I know I've got to keep it to, to 
to to a time frame too. But uh, um, but thank you for giving me that opportunity. Sure. And the nice thing about the fact that this is recorded and it's going to be on YouTube and anybody can come and watch it later is that they can just pause when one of those slides is up big and they can they can look at all the little things and find all the hidden bits that you may not even have spoken about. So yeah, it's yeah. it's years of experience that that I have to fit into a, a short presentation. And so yeah. so feel free to watch and rewatch this video and take whatever nuggets you can. Okay. Um, I, I claim experience only not expert, but just just sharing my experience so that others can also benefit hopefully from that too mm -hmm. yeah. well you're the perfect person for this show because that's what we're doing too we don't have a big community but we can share things on youtube so when you were doing all of this stuff um i think you had a video i saw about the behind the scenes stuff is that something you'd like <laughs> me to play sure and i can give a little bit of prelim prelim to that um mm -hmm. my friend rick is his name who did all the video stuff um really was such a gracious uh uh volunteer for us and if you're interested in in uh connecting with him uh you can find his, his work at kestrelimagery.com uh, um, and also that others may know.com. He, he helps a friend do a business where they record the life histories of people through interviews mm. on video. So if anybody's interested in that, that's that's where you can connect with him, that others may know. And I thought that his, his setup and how it evolved was such an extraordinary thing of just a pile of spaghetti and screens and things in the, in the room. Um, that I had to get it on video so that people could see what we went through to set up to do live streaming coffee with birds. And so that's what this video is about. So why don't you go ahead and play that? Okay, here we go. And finding the button. There we go. Hello, everybody. Thought we'd take you on a little behind the scenes tour here with Coffee with the Birds. We're setting up on Friday and uh, in preparation for Saturday. And uh, first I wanna give you a little uh, look at what I see. Turn the camera around. There's my view out the window. Got a video monitor in front of me too so I can see what's going on online. But I think we need to switch this over to Rick, because he's going to give us an intro to his setup over here and how he runs the show behind the scenes. So we've got a zoom camera here that um, I can switch or zoom in and out where we happen to be seeing birds at the time. Um, we also have three stationary cameras. One is on Curtis, one is on Peter 1, one is on Peter 8, and all can be switched here. And this also mixer records the audio for the outside sound and for Curtis. So the laptop is doing the streaming through YouTube, and then I can control the switcher and audio on this monitor here too. And then we also have an assistant here. Hello, I uh, respond to your comments. <laughs> this is Jessica. <laughs> she manages the PowerPoint behind the scenes and responds to comments. So that's a little bit of a behind the scenes tour here in the wild I've done for Coffee with Birds. We hope you've been, been enjoying uh, Coffee with the Birds this season and uh, hope you join us again uh, next year as well. Take care.
Okay. Well, that was very nice. Yeah, thanks for thanks for showing that. Yeah, that uh, yeah. was a lot of fun setting it up. Um, one some good news um, is that uh, we actually have gotten a technology grant here at the Nature Center, and we're on the verge of getting some of our tech uh, installed, uh, bought and installed here, hopefully within the next month or so, um, wow. before the fall anyways, um, where we'll have uh, some cameras, uh, we'll have uh, the ability to use those cameras for live streaming for public and private programs, school programs and things like that, but also to set them up for coffee with the birds. And so it'll be a little bit less of a, a finagle of, of equipment that Rick would have to bring in to, to do that. And we may end up being able to do a feeder camera. Um, which would mm -hmm. kind of be like a 24 hour feeder cam. And I, I'm excited about that option too. Um, and uh, um, so, yeah, that's, that's some of the up and coming things that are going on um, that, uh, that I'm excited about here. And, th and so this continues to evolve and it continues to innovate and, and uh, with the help of others and the support of others uh, here at the nature center and in Ottawa County parks and in the community uh, too. So how often do you have the uh, coffee with the birds? Is it every week, every month? What is it? Good question. Um, so with with birding, spring tends to be out and about. You get out and you enjoy the birds when they're migrating through. Here in Michigan, we get mass migration of warblers and things like that. And, and same within the fall. We get a lot of outdoor activities. The weather's real nice. Um, winter is is a time to uh, maybe spend a little bit more time indoors. It's a little less birdy outside. Um, so where do you watch the birds? At your bird feeders. So we do it in the winter, uh, December, January, February, and March. We do it once a month, so four in a season. Um, it's quite a production. So we we um, and we have other things going on at the nature center too. So we can't we can't do it uh, weekly. But what we uh, do for the public is monthly. It's uh, one Saturday a month, 9.30 in the morning, Eastern time. Um, and if anybody's interested in watching some of those videos from this past season and the season before, they can go onto the website. You wanna just throw up that slide there, uh, the, the 16th slide there with the takeaways. It's miottawa.org slash birding. Um, and you can find the um, yep, that's the, that's the website. Yep. you got the website right there. You can uh, scroll down and you can find videos. Um, and, uh, there's a coffee with the birds link. There's also coffee with the birds video resources down below, um, where you can watch these. They're online now. Um, you don't have to see it. Uh, you don't ha have to see it live. You can watch it anytime. Um, so, so if you want to check it out, that's where you can do it. Um, they'll live forever there. But yeah, four times in a, in a season is what we do now. However, we do also offer, um, especially for senior and other adult groups, we'll offer to do a, a private type of a coffee with the birds program, maybe not quite as elaborate, where, where people come into the wildlife den, watch the birds at the feeder, and um, yeah, chat about birds and birding. Um, and that doesn't have to be online. That can just be in person too. But we could do it also online especially when we get this new technology uh, set in our nature center. We should be able to do that. So you can see the video playlists there. And if you click that, then there's all kinds of different playlists that drop down from the menu. And um, one of them is the Coffee with the Birds playlist. There you can see uh, the top left there is the Coffee with the Birds. There's all kinds of other birding uh, videos. Uh, one of my passions coming out of the, the pandemic and the innovation is that I love doing videos. And so I do that even in my off time. And I've made birding videos. I have my own YouTube channels. People want to check that out too. You can find it through the videos that you see on here. Um, some of them I do for the park and then some of them I just do on my own because I enjoy it. Uh, my YouTube handle is ovenbirder98. You can find me there. Um, but uh, lots of fun, uh, lots of fun doing videos. And that, that website also has all kinds of other resources, local resources for birding. Um, it also has uh, links to bird identification resources um, and bird clubs and things like that. So it's a great
great, great place to go. And if you want to find out something about Ottawa County Parks Beyond Birds, you're right on the website there, so you can check it out there. Great. Well, uh, yeah, I we were talking beforehand. I was going, now, do you think we can really fill an hour? Yeah, I think we can <laughs> fill an hour. So uh, we're not going to get to a lot of questions today, but I, let's do one question. Alan, can you put up a question for us? And it says, what kind of birds would one see in flight over Lake Michigan? So if you're standing on the shore, what would you see? Well, in the, in the summertime, mostly gulls, ring-billed gulls, herring gulls, maybe a Caspian tern uh, at our latitude of Michigan anyways. But the real fun is in the winter for birding at Lake Michigan. And we get a lot of waterfowl that come comes from up north. So we'll get long-tailed ducks, uh, common and red-breasted mergansers, um, buffleheads, and uh, common golden eye, things like that. Quite a diversity of ducks uh, on the water. One of the, the, and a lot of those birds like to be way out on Lake Michigan. So they come into the shore only, only sometimes. And you can see big, huge uh, uh, flocks of birds well, they look like wisps of smoke on the horizon way out there. And that's long-tailed ducks by the thousands, if not tens of thousands, out on the horizon. Um, we also get some yaggers um, coming through in the, in the fall in particular. So if you're lucky, you might see a parasitic yager flying through. But uh, quite, a, quite a bit. Oh, we do get other species of terns, too, common and, and forester's terns. So quite a diversity. Okay. So do you do... Well, here here in California, we do what we call pelagic trips, where we go out in the ocean. I know Lake Michigan isn't an ocean, but do you do pelagic trips? So people have done some pelagics. Now, it hasn't gone commercial or anything like that. It's just been some, some uh, friends of mine that I have actually gone on one. Um, and the, one of the videos on, uh, on the website that I have posted there that I did on my own is of a parasitic Jaeger circling our boat out on Lake uh -huh. Michigan. So it's a lot of fun. Um, they're fun. They chase the gulls around and things. So, um, so yes, yeah, some people do uh, pelagic birding. Now, it's not you're not going to see albatrosses or shearwaters or things like that. Um, I'm a little jealous of the pelagic birding there in California. I've not done any pelagic birding in California. I have birded in California, mm -hmm. uh, but not pelagic. Um, but uh, one of the times that I come out there, I'm going to have to to try a pelagic trip um, yeah. for sure. Yeah. I have well, done a pelagic trip in North Carolina. When I lived in North Carolina, I went out to Cape Hatteras and did a pelagic trip out there and enjoyed well, seeing the whales and dolphins and things along with the birds. And it's a, a very different thing when you have salt water and you have fresh water. Curtis, we're running out of time. It's, it's <laughs> astonishing. Okay, so thank you, uh, viewers, for joining us today. This is Birding with Lois, and I'm Lois Richter, and this... This is Curtis Dykstra. He's from Michigan. Good place to be. That's right. We <laughs> love our state. We love Michigan. Come visit us sometime. And if you're a birder, you kind of have to come to Michigan to see the Kirtland's Warbler. And if you have more questions on that, maybe that's a topic for another day. We can do another species. show. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All Endangered right. species that nests here in Michigan. So you got to come check it out and let me know if you're in the neighborhood. I will do that whatever. And then our crew today is JJ and Alan. Very light crew, and thank you folks for doing such a good job. Uh, this is Birding with Lois, and you can reach us at this very website. Actually, that's an email address, but it's okay. Write if you'd like to send in a message, or if you'd like to help with the show, or you would like to do anything else. And so, Curtis and I say to you, Bye-bye. Thanks for being with us.